Are you all sitting comfortably? Then I begin. It's only people at the start who understand that uh, gets that. So listen, you're all very welcome here uh, this evening to Queen's University, to our glorious Canada room. Um, apologies, not able to bring in the light. It both means we can't look at the screen and it's also blinding. So please don't kill us in terms of uh, being hypocrites, talking about green issues and recording the lights and uh, having sunlight outside. I'd just explain as well, we do have some book um, for hard hearing and deaf. So particularly when it comes to the Q&A session, if people just speak normally, but try not to talk over each other, it just makes it easier for the signers to, to follow. My name is uh, John Barry, uh, and I'm very scared. I've been on the radio quite a bit today about the climate crisis, what's happening in Rhodes and Corfu, and I'm deeply worried. I've been at this game for nearly 40 years as an academic, and the models are showing that we are coming to tipping points in the planet's systems quicker than even the science was predicting. So I'm tired because like many perhaps in the room here, we've been fighting to try and bring the science, remember that phrase, listen to the science that we all heard during the pandemic. Some of us have been getting involved in politics and political activism, we see Will Obama, the man who grows trees uh, down the back, we talk about that perhaps in his contributions. So for me, it's, it's wonderful to invite uh, Katie here to, uh, to Belfast, welcome home. Uh, to the island, given that I know you uh, you work and live in both New York and RD. So for me, I have to say, uh, as somebody who's been a, a social scientist looking at the climate and ecological crisis for many, many decades, um, and also a political activist, full disclosure, I'm a recovering politician. <laughs> I used to be leader of the Green Party here in Northern Ireland, and also a councillor for seven years where I lived in Hollywood. In all that films, 11 years a slave, seven years a counselor. I used to be as big and strong as Philip at the back there, and look what's worn me down. Battling the DUP, not to even accept climate change. That's another one thing, except evolution, which we uh, <laughs> tend to forget. But actually, reading uh, Katie's book was a joy. Not only because, because I'm a dumb professor. I was only about a quarter of the way in. I said, what's all these strange tree things <laughs> that I'm seeing? And then I went back to the start and realised it's a new alphabet. And that made the book particularly uh, aesthetically beautiful, I have to say, Katie, uh, aesthetically beautiful. I think also the format of these short stories, poems, reflections, meaning that uh, there's a, a variety, not only in terms of the trees being used, but the formats are explored in the book. And ultimately, it's a very hopeful book. You know, um, there used to be a phrase that many of us in the environmental movement would say, think like a mountain. And that comes from the great uh, American environmentalist, Aldo Leopold. You know, talking about that, from that long sense of time. You know, we, we, we barely are able to deal with seasons in terms of our food. You know, our economic system is completely out of kilter with the rhythms of the planet and that, that deep time that you get in, in your read Katie's book, you know, trees think on a different time scale than we do. Water courses think on a different time scale. In fact, as one of the authors in, in the book says, you know, trees have been here before humans. And the way we're going, they'll be here long after us. We tend to forget that human beings are not just like animals, we are animals. You know, we're a species that have evolved on this planet and we've co-evolved with trees, we've co-evolved with other animals, you know, most of whom we've domesticated for food and for fuel and so on. And certainly I think that the book is a wonderful way to ground us in, in the earth. You know, people forget that, you know, we often visually just see the tree and the carpaceous branches and the foliage, but we forget about that underneath there's all these wonderful rhizomatic connections being made by the tree. And that all we see is the surface and not actually the full extent of it. So for me, um, I finished reading it um, yesterday. And it's got indigenous wisdom. 
those Owen stones, those Irish indigenous uh, thinking, there's also a very scientific kind of analysis. So I think the book has something for, for everybody. I almost feel like for those of you who know the Nate Nate show with Gay Bar, I'd love to say there's one for everybody in the audience. There is one outside for anybody who would like to purchase one. And Katie has said that after uh, we've had our discussion, uh, she's happy to sign it. So the format for this evening is going to be, I'm going to pass over now to Declan Owens of Eco Justice Ireland, um, the Haldane Radical Socialist Lawyers, and many other things that can kind of explain. Then Katie will say a few words. And um, just at the background there is going to be the uh, running loop of, of images associated with uh, with the book, and then we've got plenty of time, hopefully, for any discussion and questions. We are going to end at 8 o'clock, so I think some people are saying, oh my God, this is down from 6 to 9. Uh, we will end at, uh, at 8 o'clock. So without further ado, I'll pass over to, to Declan. So I don't know whether you can sit there or you want to come up here. Yeah. <laughs> So thanks, John. Um, just to give a bit of introduction and to explain why I have the honour to sit between these two um, people. Um, so my name is Declan Owens. I qualify as a lawyer, but as many people in the room will know, um, the law doesn't necessarily and usually doesn't provide for justice. So I am focused on being a socialist lawyer, and now that's evolved to be an eco-socialist lawyer because that is the time that we live in. Um, that has evolved after being away from Ireland for 20 years, returning to um, set up an environmental non-profit called Eco Justice Ireland. And it also has a sister company called Eco Justice Legal Action Centre and the um, initials of that I actually have branded with Katie's um, trees. So um, that, that was my initial thinking, my initial um, outreach to Katie. And we interacted a lot over Twitter and email and Zoom over the last number of years. So it's, it's really a pleasure to see her in person and um, welcome her to Belfast. Um, just in relation to Justice Ireland, um, the idea is to provide a means by which people can um, engage in a just transition in an Irish society. So like climate change, I, I don't recognise the border and therefore change jurisdiction of the whole island in the work that I've been doing with communities. Um, it is community focused. Um, the communities that I include are um, non-human species as well. I work with others and try to be an advocate for the rights of nature. And that's another group in which Katie and I are involved in arguing for who will stand, who will uh, speak for the trees. Well, Katie certainly does in her book, and um, many others are advocating for the rights of nature, which um, have successfully been. Um, incorporated into the recommendations of the Citizens' Assembly on biodiversity loss. And, and that's very necessary because the island of Ireland um, is one of the worst for um, biodiversity loss in the world. It was recently listed as 13th in the world for um, being depleted of its uh, biodiversity. And I guess one of the things for me is trying to think through how to work in this environment. Um, I have a background as a human rights and trade union lawyer, and I think uh, collective action is the most important way in which we can deal with this um, crisis. And for me, that means um, advocating within the trade union movement and um, trying to um, push the dial there so that the movement really, really gets behind what needs to be done. But it also means working with local communities and engage with communities all over the island. Um, but another way in which I've sought to do that, because I think people don't necessarily feel the attraction to um, 
law, policy, and trade unionism. So local communities and the way in which I try to engage is through the arts also because um, I've got a number of directors who are artists or in the arts. One's a folk singer. He sings about a, a tree that was being felled to um, provide shipbuilding for the empire. And you know that's that's uh, you know very emotionally resonant for people. It um, you know it's another way of thinking through these issues and engaging with people. Similarly, um, I work with a, a novelist who engages in ancient Irish mythology as a way to sort of draw out our art history and our, our different way of thinking and being in relation to the land. And um, also a fine artist who um, records the, the beauty that we, we want to preserve. So um, as a sort of introduction to what Katie will be taking us through, I just wanted to read um, a reflection from her book by Amakov Gosh, where he says, this is a great burden that now rests upon writers artists, filmmakers, and everyone else who's involved in the telling of stories. To us falls a task of imaginatively restoring agency and voice to non-humans. So there is plenty more um, such wisdom within the book. And um, like Gary, I try to um, bring forward a different story and to redefine justice as equal justice. Um, it's a pleasure to work with Katie and others in that class. Can you all hear me? I realise now I don't have the microphone. <laughs> Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Um, thank you, so uh, lots of thanks. I could spend the next hour just saying thank you to all the people. Um, John, Stefan, Linda Sullivan is not here. Um, I'm talking about her and her family right now. And the contributors. So one thing I, I don't know if either of you actually mentioned. So this book that we're here to celebrate the language of trees. Both did talk about community and people. You know, books about trees, obviously, but it's about humans and the animals that we are and the communities that we are. And books made up of, uh, I don't know, some people have said 50 some people have said 60, one place even said 70 contributors. So there are, it's like a compendium. So I, I'm an, an artist and I have, like a magpie, I've collected a lot of incredible people like Anna Gosh. And so huge thank you to all of the contributors because it's, it's their work that's in here that I've translated it to prove. And I think you know, we're all here because we are trying to figure out how can we live in a time of emergency how can we react and respond and come together? Because we can't do it on our own as individuals. And it's one reason I thought it was um, useful, maybe nice to have the, this forest drawing that I made on the cover is because it shows how our thinking has changed. And, you know, in my lifetime, when I was little, we were taught that tree, they, it's survival of the fittest, right? So the, the largest tree is going to get the most light and grow faster than the others and to get the most nutrients and to go the down and gather everything. Sorry. There's no mobile mic, so if I do this, does that work better? If I should do Sorry? Yeah. I I tend to sit on the side so I can see the images behind me. Now I can't see them. <laughs> so um does this help? I don't know if it helps, but hopefully I'll do my best. Um, so, so yes, so this drawing um, on the front cover I thought was useful to, to see how things, our thinking has changed. So we now know, thanks to Suzanne Samar, who's in the book as well, and others who've done the science over decades, right, that trees, it's not survival of the fittest, they all work together in community. So it's sharing of resources, they communicate together, and it's not that, you know, one is better than the other and stronger than the other. It's the way humans work too, right? In the community, we need each other, 
and we have to work together. So, um, the, so I, I feel like I'm, I'm shaking and racing. So I, forgive me, I, I'm suffering from a form of lung COVID called dysautonomia. So it means my breathing and my heart rate and everything, all those things that should, should happen automatically, um, don't. So it's hard for me to catch my breath. So shaving um, like this is really difficult for me and I might get out of breath. So then Declan and John <coughs> can jump in and rescue me. Um, so where was I going with this? So the, so the book is about trees, but it's about humans. We're all entangled together and how, so you know, uh, Declan mentioned Bikes of Nature in this campaign that we're on. I feel like this book for me is part of my campaign and it's a way to contribute to this movement that's now, you know, we talk about it sweeping the globe. Well, if the indigenous communities um, have been you know, talking about this forever, for hundreds of years, and we're slowly waking up in our Western communities and realizing we don't protect our landscapes, right, and our homes, which are embedded in the natural world, then we're not protecting ourselves. So rights of nature is about rights of humans, too, right, so rights of water systems, forests, uh, um, Everything, <laughs> rights of nature and these rights of humans. And I've gotten into trouble with one of the groups I co founded, Friends of Arden Ball. The images, I can't see the images, so I feel like I'm out of control frequently here. But um, because people do depend on peatlands, so this is a specific example that I had to, I'm living with right now, feel threatened by this phenomenon of rights of nature. If the peatland has rights, then that means the humans who have the turbary rights, the right for generations their families to have the rights to harvest. Harvest. I think the language, this book is about language. The words that we use have so much resonance and meaning and emotion that tie to them. So we use words like harvesting, turf, and what we're doing is the thing with the cobalt that goes into the making of all of our phones and computers and gadgets. It's what feeding the planet alive, right? These resources that are finite. You've got people like Jason Pickle, who's not in the book, but you know, he talks about deep growth. So these um, systems, all of the systems of how we live as a species on the planet, have to be rethought. And it, you know, I was talking to Colin Sands this morning, so I came from Ross Trevor yesterday, and we were talking about it. It's just bomb. I started using really aggressive language like this because we're in the fight of our lives. If you could just bomb up this system of the tornadoes that are happening now in Switzerland today, tornadoes in Switzerland could just blow up this, this economic system and we could just start over. Would not be nice? <laughs> 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 we could just make that happen, the climate emergency hit the <coughs> systems, the people in power. Um, so maybe I'll just take a pause because yeah. I'm. Yeah. I mean, we plan tonight as a conversation, so if people do want to, to jump in, just put your hand up and uh, we can come to you. But one of the things about the book um, is, despite the fact that if you are not shit scared about what's happening at the moment, you're, you're not alive about what's happening in the world. This is not a new normal that we're seeing in these wildfires. We've had a global heat dome on three continents. We had excessive heat, such that we, the Earth has never seen this in 100,000 years. 100,000 years. This is not a new normal, folks. It's going to get worse. But the way the climate system actually you know, functions is that the carbon and the greenhouse gas is like methane. And there's a big conversation we're going to need on the island of Ireland because our biggest sector that creates greenhouse gases, that cause the climate crisis, is not from cars, it's not from electricity or coal, oil or gas, it's our farming system. And it's a big issue that we're going to have to try and get our heads around. What is a just transition for our farming communities as we move away from a heavy dairy and beef based agricultural system? Who knew? We grow grass very well. That's the basis of our uh, agricultural system, but it's unsustainable. We've also seen degrees that it's not possible for human beings to live. So in Iran, was recorded a temperature of 66 degrees Celsius. That's beyond the capacity of human beings to be able to sweat, 
that's how we you know regulate our, our, our meat. And I think there is in and again related to Katie's book, I want to talk about three cheers for the apocalypse. Because what we're witnessing now is an apocalyptic vision of our future and our children's future. And I think I'll, I'll say the quiet part out loud. Many of us are concerned for our kids and grandkids. And certainly in the academy, it's something that we're not very comfortable with talking about, particularly male, heterosexual, white professors. We don't really talk about our emotions. But the reality is the science is pretty frightening. It's pretty conclusive. It's got to the stage now that when I teach here at Queen's University, I have to put trigger warnings on the courses that I teach just to remind these young people that may have some sense of the climate and ecological crisis, but perhaps don't realize the extent of it, to moderate their own emotional reaction. And actually with my colleague, Louise Taylor here, we put on extra classes for students in terms of their mental health because there's a mental health crisis to this. And it's particularly why we should be angry. Our futures are being stolen from us. Our governments are asleep at the wheel. And what if we're the people we've been waiting for? Not Elon Musk, who's now changed Twitter to X. And his solution to all of this is to bugger off to Mars. That's your crazy stuff. But yeah, that's given credence in public debate. And people like me and Declan, I don't know where Katie stands on this, but people like me say capitalism has to go. Endless economic growth has to go. We need to move on to something better beyond excessive consumerism, yet we're seen as the radicals. Whereas Elon Musk and his dreams of colonizing Mars, that's given serious consideration. Why is it that it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism? How have we come as a society to think that this system, which is at most 40 years old, excessive growth, consumerism, long global supply chains. Why do we think this is going to continue forever? And the apocalyptic is a term that I think is misunderstood. We, we view it as a kind of a negative. And just think of our cultural imaginaries on this issue. The zombie apocalypse. Don't look up. The day after tomorrow. Elysium, that's a little bit more positive. But most of our imaginations of the future are unremittingly grim. At least in Katie's book, and it doesn't shy away from some of the negative dimensions. There's one particularly very poignant part in the book, and I forget the author, um, I think he's an African American who talks about his father wanting to leave him up in a tree. I won't tell you the full story. Given how the tree in America was the site of the lynching of black people. An example here in Ireland might be in terms of the negative aspects of trees. We often go to visit the big houses on this island. Well, you can plant a tree in the full knowledge and security that your grandson or great great grandson will enjoy it if you own and control the property. But Kelly's book is not a panacea that everything is fine. Trees are memory, trees are records, trees are companions, but they're also associated with negative aspects of the human experience. But the apocalypse, from its Greek sense, simply means the lifting of a veil. It's a revelation. So the apocalypse is a moment of being woke in the proper sense of the term, although if Suella Braverman and Priti Patel were to hear me, I'd be part of the literati, tofu-eating, sandal-wearing, <laughs> beardy, greeny, elite, guilty <laughs> as Charles may not care. This is a fight for our children and grandchildren. And the apocalypse, of which I think you get an element of it in, in, in Katie's book, and it's not all, as I say, positive, is that moment of revelation. You know, that it's a lifting of a veil, if you want to do the, the, the etymological translation of the word apocalypse. Now, that does have religious connotations, and I speak now as a completely collapsed Catholic, not even a lapsed one, although I do respect people of, of the book. And actually, Katie's book, I think also has a resonance with, I think, the King James Bible. There are other biblical uh, interpretations available as well, but the one that I read is the King James one, as well as the Quran and the religious books as well. Some great wisdom there. The beautiful 
in my view, pros love poems of the planet. I don't really believe there's an awful world male deities. And I'm curious that the deities of Judeo Christianity don't even exist on the earth, that they live somewhere off it and so on. But the Bible has some good lines in it. Without vision, the people perish. Without vision, the people perish. And I think that's the moment we're in now as a species. We're kind of wakening up now to the reality of the climate crisis. It's sad though, it's only when rich white people are affected that suddenly it grabs our attention. In the same way, white Ukrainian refugees, come on in. It'll be grand. Black, brown, yellow refugee hole. And I think we need to take a hard look at ourselves as societies because the reason is, if you read the climate science, and even if we were to elect Katie as the world's prime minister, <laughs> and she was to ban all fossil fuels and the mass planting of trees and the rewetting of bogs, it still means that we have baked in inevitable climate breakdown in the decades ahead. So we're going to have to adapt to a warmer and more destabilized world. You know, as Katie, in one of her contributions, or one of her contributors to the book says, trees breathe out, we breathe in. It's from the trees that we get oxygen at the basis of, of our life. But this is romantic, and I do think we're going to need poetry, we're going to need culture, as well as science, because the science story is not grabbing people's hearts. Geeks like me, we get really excited about the proportion of the greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture and so on. I want to need that stuff. But for ordinary citizens, what's the story? How does it touch my heart, my values? Not just your head. That kind of dealing with science and facts and figures will not often move people. And the reason why I think the likes of Katie's book is so important at this moment, almost like being called forth, at this moment of great peril and opportunity, as many of you know, the Chinese symbol of crisis is opportunity. That we're at this inflection point as, as a species. And that the story that you find in Katie's book at this time is a ban. I think for the activists out there, we can be too hard on ourselves that we are constantly doom scrolling on Twitter with bad for your mental health that you're constantly policing your own actions. Oh my God, I drove to the shop while I'm walking, I'm a hypocrite. We're all bloody hypocrites. We cannot be anything else in the world that we created. And you find, I think, in, in Katie's book and others like it, I definitely recommend in a similar vein, Rebecca Solomon, who we may know, Open the Dark and so forth. And the thing for me that I take from Katie's book, and that's a conversation that we do need to have as, as citizens, as parents, as grandparents, is where are we going to find hope? I am a drug addict. I like opium. Where are we going to find our hope? Because too often we, we have a very pale version of that in what I would call optimism. Optimism is what we say in Ireland, it would be grand. And what that means is no agency. It's all going to work itself out. The government is going to solve it. You know, we'll invent a whiz bang technology, or God forbid, the government is going to come and save us. None of those things, in my view, are going to happen. So I don't think we should be optimistic. Because optimism, you know, if you read the wonderful uh, Czech, former president of, of the Czech Republic and playwright Václav Havel, He's got a wonderful poem called Hope that I recommend you all read. And in that poem, he says, you know, hope is not the same as optimism. Optimism is the happy thought that you're going to fully realize wherever it is you set out. And here's the difficulty, and I'll end here and then pass back to Katie. To be really hopeful at this moment in human history, we have to have agency. Agency. This is what's so inspiring about people like Greta Thunberg. Again, somebody who's been thrown up at this moment as an icon, as an inspiration, even though she didn't want it herself, she also was very uncomfortable with it. But she's very clear. Activism, when you get active and become a gentle, hope is all around you. 
But we need to get active. I also say we need to get angry at the motivators as well and point out the injustices of what's going on. The very people in the world that have least caused the damage are the ones who want to suffer the most. But we need agency for hope, and there's plenty of that in Katie's book. But here's the other. The shadow side of hope is failure. We have to be open to the possibility of collapse, that we will not make it through, that there is no plug-and-play version of the future. I think many of us, for partly ways of self-protecting ourselves, we have, yes, it's bad, it's terrible, but the future will be kind of more or less like us, like it is now, but maybe with better apps and green energy. The kind of biofuel the Hummer. Who's going to take out the bad fossil fuels in the Hummer, standing in for our current society, and we'll have green business as usual. I'm going to tell you that ain't going to be how the future pans out. We're going to need, I think, to engage in that creative and imaginative difficult thoughts about <coughs> questioning. What is the good life? What does it we want? I mean, these, these deep questions that we find often very difficult, certainly in the academy. We don't want to talk about these things. They're too personal. It's a bit religious. <coughs> bit political follow capitalism. It's simply a system of how we've organised the world. We can invent and you know, reimagine different systems. That's why, for, for me, I gravitate more towards politics and economics, those kind of harder things. But we also want to need poetry. Because in poetry and imaginative forms of literature, that's where I think we can be much more creative than policy, manifestos, politics. And so I want to need that as well. And no better place than the island of Ireland, where we have a rich history. Yes, this part of the island very contested, obviously, historically. But there's a rich history of tradition. You know, we've all seen it. You drive around Ireland, and you'll see a fairy tree in the middle of a field. You ask the farmer, that must be awkward to get around. And he says, oh, I don't believe in fairies, but I'm not cutting it down. <laughs> but there's still a residue, an echo, of that older earth, if you like, connection and so on. I think we need to build upon that. But hopefully that's been enough time, Katie, to get to work <laughs> 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 so, um, Yeah, so much that you brought up. Ricardo Phillips is the writer who mentioned that it's bad to learn about the tree and the that they are African American. He found that really disturbing as a child. And I don't know if Carl made that back on his tour here in Ireland over the winter. He had a great time in Dublin. Anyway, great writer. Uh, there's so many great people in this book. Uh, I wish we could get them all together in a room and to share stories. Because when it comes down to it, it is about stories. And that's why I made this, you know, the pre alphabet, which is at the heart of the book. You see some of the images. So um, maybe I'll explain what the pre alphabet is. Each letter, and if you get a book, there are posters and bookmarks, um, a small number. So the first bunch of people who get the book. Get the poster. Um, each letter in the alphabet gets its own tree. So it's a very simple idea. It's kind of like the ABC, um, ABC trees. And <clears throat> it's, you know, this book, you said it's very timely. It actually um, started back in 2015. It's almost 10 years old. <laughs> it feels like 100 years ago. So I made um, a book with my brother John, the writer in his publishing house in Berlin, book of Moshka. He really wanted to make a book. And I've had too many ideas. I've always been making books. Usually I like giving more for free. Sorry, they're not <laughs> free for everyone in the audience. But they're really cheap. It's only sixteen ninety nine. But um, where was I going? The tree off that. Um, so yes, so my brother John, I have too many ideas to make a book. But this came to me <coughs> at this moment and it comes just in a flash. And I knew instantly that the tree drawing that I had made 10 years before so tree time, this thinking and working on slow time, we all, we're so used to everything happening so quickly and having to happen, you know, leave it yesterday, leave it yesterday, quick, quick. Um, I, for years I've been trying to slow down and to step back from things and slow down how I've been working, you know, artists who part of this circle that is traveling the globe, going to fairs and exhibitions and museums and touring, touring, doing projects and emails, you know, 
we all know what this is like. And so I was trying to slow down and um, then I got this long COVID, which has literally slowed me down. But I realised in 2015 that the tree drawings that I made, those trees, which was each tree with its own character, like the letters of the alphabet or characters, that word that we use. Um, so the characters are the tree, and the trees are the characters. So I made a tree for each letter of the alphabet, and I scanned, which so they're all tree drawings, scanned the drawings, and what the design to make a font. And so you can type the trees, and the fonts are on my website, so you can download, and everyone can type the tree. And so everything that's in the book is translated into trees. For example, my essay here is because for I wrote something. <laughs> <laughs> It's very difficult to find writing. You know, I wanted to be a writer when I was little. You know, you came to Queens and I didn't think I know I did, but I visited. Was it over here? The English. Mm -hmm. the yeah, yeah. And so that's the only part of Queens that I've ever been in before today. Um, back when I was in sixteen or seventeen, whatever age you are when you do that. Um, and I was torn between like. I don't want to sound pretentious, but I knew I was an artist, so I guess that's how I really relate to the world that way. But the writing has always been there too, language. And so anyway, here's my essay in the back of the book, translated into trees. I think it's a pretty forest, <laughs> but everything's translated. And this act of translating something, it's the, um, there are so many ways that's really important for me, but this very simple idea of translating art. Letters of the alphabet, those 26 little letters that form every word that we use. So every word in the universe is made of 26, it's not that many little letters. But those letters themselves all came from something. So A, Colin mentioned it yesterday, the letter A, visually it was made to represent the ox, the cow, the horns, because cows are very important, are very important, which relates to dairy in Ireland and cows now. Um, and then, of course, the in Ireland, we have this many people tree alphabet, the old images up there somewhere. <laughs> you know, and also in the book, Angus Woods wrote a, um, an essay to share the. Let me see if I can just quickly. Uh, I've had it. Uh, so here we go. So, a lot of you probably know how the old works, right? So it's got a main stem, a line. And then the little branches of the twigs come off on either side, and then you can read, if you know, the ABC, which I've got here, the key. Um, it's written just like how plants grow, right? Plants have this main trunk, and then the leaves come off either side. So those humans way back in the fifth century or so were communicating to other humans using this visual system that mirrored how plants grow. And it just it always felt like this was something um, so we put that to be an Irish. We've got this tree out that it's really special. You can't really understand it. Um, I was never taught it at school. Uh, and a very um, uh, Brian O'Doherty, the um, artist known formerly known as Patrick Ireland. Brian um, talked about learning. Oh, he went to school in Longford. I actually he was born in Dublin, grew up in Longford, and I was ten when he was tiny. I always thought this mention of Brian. Anyway, he made a lot of work based on his own alphabet. So we're not taught it in school, or I wasn't. But it's part of who I am. I feel like there's this cellular memory, maybe, of the of the old. We've got old stones. We presume it would have been carved into trees, but they don't survive anymore. Um, so as soon as I had the tree alphabet idea back in 2015, it seemed kind of obvious. It's like, of course I made the tree alphabet. And then so we made that book, it was called Big Trees, and it's inside of this book. So that book came out in 2015, and we knew immediately it was, uh, there's a hunger, that's what Colin was saying yesterday, there's a hunger for this book. So we needed to make more of them. <laughs> and finally, it's taken this long, publishing is a funny old business. So yes, this book is timely, but it's been around for a while, and I think there is this really it's been building for many years, like with the rights of nature groups, and you know, I include extinction symbol is included in the book. But back in 2015, there was an extinction symbol, I can't grab it now, it's on my bag, it's 
circle for planet Earth with the yellow glass representing the river name of China. So Max Porter, who calls the book a masterpiece on the cover, <laughs> very embarrassing. But Max was, um, he loved the book of Atrium because he'd never heard of the extinction symbol. So that was 2015, right before Greta started climate striking. And then 2018, that was 2018, then extinction rebellion was formed. So the book, that was a long-winded way of saying the book was not that it was ahead of its time, but people have been doing this for a long time and having these conversations that got really important for me to play on that magpie to bring together all of these different conversations that are happening in different fields, like the visual artists, because there are artists in here, like Tassi Bedin and Billy Pell and Rhea Bowers, um, Maya Lynn, Charles Gaines, so visual artists and poets and writers and scientists and musicians, and so all of this is gathered together in one place. So what the hope is that it's a way to share knowledge that I found really helpful and useful over the years and the decades, because yes, I'm that old, and that it's all in one little, very um, containable little container of a book, because yes, I love books. Um, but it exists beyond the book with posters and the font, and it comes back to me, you know, we're starting to meet each other now and like being you know, the contributors who are in here and we help along the way. And I kept, you know, just all of these conversations keep going back to the stories, right? And so this is the, <laughs> my, my COVID brain realizing the whole beginning of this spiel was me trying to introduce the tree out there. And it's really when I felt that I need to look at the out there. But I was hosting salons, so the image of one of the Sunday salons that I was hosting at home with my partner in um, Sunday afternoon gatherings where we were just talking about the hospitals for organ activism in the Anthropocene. So all of these conversations, you know, everything's going to hell in the handbasket, what can we do? And I'm always cooking meals and we'll always have the same conversations, like the washing machine spinning around and around. So we need to have more people. So it's not just for having these conversations. So we brought in people we would have our coffee and cake, and these conversations would go on for hours. You know, we would advertise that it's three hours, and we'd go on sometimes five, six, dinner, <laughs> and late. Uh, and sometimes it was short, but we would always end up talking about storytelling, the importance of the stories that we tell each other, and that we need to remember our own creation stories, so the fairies, the myths, mm -hmm. um, you know, Ireland is kind of tricky with all of this. But again, it's like the old, I was never taught it at school and told about that stuff that was kind of embarrassing or something that we would kind of snigger at. Um, now, there's a we're kind of coming around, like the veil, <laughs> the apocalyptic veil is lifting and we're realizing, wait, this is really important. It's who we are, it's where we come from. The old place names are telling us what was been before, and it's just laying to this landscape. So, when I was mentioned before about right, Friends are involved in the rights of nature. It's the need to protect our home. So all of it comes back to love, right? We can't protect something unless we know it and we love it. And so naming things is the first step. You've got to name something so we can love it. Um, and then that makes me think of Robin Wall Kimmer, her essay in here, where she's talking about the thinking pronouns instead of referring to, to animals and objects and um, non human beings as it, right? So you could say, oh, my granny, um, you know, it's cooking in the kitchen. My granny's cooking in the kitchen. You would not call another human being an it. But we do this with um, living with, with non humans. So it's to, it's really about our brains having to realize this fundamental reality, right? We're humans and these other humans are as well. So they need a pronoun. So she probably proposes he. Um, K-I, and those two little words, but that comes from the Palawami language, but the two words are in kin, kind, and kinship, and it just feels like it was meant to be, but it's so hard, even though I think about it, and I try and do it myself, it's really difficult. Um, so, should I take another pause there? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in and um, try and sort of um, expand upon the idea of the rights of nature because um, we've referred to it a few times and um, I think it's just helpful to have a practical example. So 
In law, the idea of a corporation is a legal fiction. There's no inherent um, right or necessity. It has no right to exist, the corporation. And we know through the capitalist structure, together with property rights, it, it is um, destroying the earth in which we, we live. Um, so the idea with the rights of nature would be that it's theoretically possible for a tree to sue the government for the mismanagement of our planning system, for example. And um, it's legally, conceptually possible for a tree to sue corporation for damaging a forest. And um, this isn't fictional in the sense that it doesn't happen. It does happen in other countries. Um, it um, has happened in Bolivia and Ecuador, where they've recognized it in the constitution. And um, a group of us with the um, Environmental Justice Network Ireland made submissions to the Citizens' Assembly on Biodiversity Loss. And the, the idea was to tell a new story, to tell a way of thinking, a vision of the future. And that is, through the Constitution, something that we can achieve. Um, I think the, the idea of centering the way of being as a state, whether it's in the North, the South, both, or um, the North as part of the UK, there is this possibility that myself and other advocates are, are trying to imagine. So, for example, um, my colleague Peter Dorn um, and I made submissions to the um, Shannon public consultation on um, the constitutional future of the island. And, and we said the rights of nature should be the basis for a reimaginary of what this island is, but also could be. So, for example, that would mean we could have bioregional um, ways of looking at the island instead of um, territorial, artificial means of separation. So you could have, instead of the mismanagement of Loch Ness by four different um, councils, you could have Loch Ness as a bioregion, or the Shannon, um, which is named after the, the goddess uh, Siona, I think. Um, but it's a, just a different way of thinking about the land in which we I just also wanted to reflect on what Katie was saying with um, translations and the book that was out recently, um, 30 Words for Fame, gives a, an idea of how we lost touch with the landscape and fields because the idea that there's only one word for field in English, whereas there's 30, and I'm told more actually in Irish, is something significant and something that we've lost in the colonization process and the play by Brian Freeman translations captures some of that. It captures the um, the angst that people felt at the time, the dislocation and this has a an historical legacy which which I think continues. But the book talks about the Shabwe New Year and how the indigenous calendar is linked to Mother Earth and not to dead Roman um, emperors or um, fallen gods. And I think that if we think of the giant redwood, which, um, you know, has outlasted um, the system of capitalism, you know, it, it is a sign of hope, I think. And, um, you know, albeit John has set out the the nature of the revelation, hopefully that will be um, an act of hope of reimagining our, our world, our language through trees, our constitution through the rights of nature, and um, the way in which we can collectively um, achieve a just transition or just transformation as, as we may need. I love that you mentioned this. Winona LeDuc's, um her contribution the Ojibwe New Year is I used it to introduce the book, so Ross gave um, very generously. I don't think he was writing as well known over here. Um, an incredible writer, you're in for a treat if you haven't read him already. Um, but he offered to, you heard about the book, he 
the office to write the introduction. Fiction still blows me away. Um, so it was his introduction, but then the first piece is Winona the Jukes. And I thought it was really important to have to include the <coughs> indigenous voices and um, just other ways of relating to the landscape, right? So you mentioned Winona talks about the, um, the new, a different calendar. So our Roman calendar is just months that we have are just fiction, it's about the, uh, the all the rest of the planet system. And their way of relating and knowing about time is when the sap rises. So that's when you know the new year has started, when the sap is rising, the maple tree. And so this, that connection is something that we've become so disconnected from. And if we, I think with COVID, with the lockdowns, it was really, um, it was this explosion of interest in gardening and getting seeds and planting and having this suddenly, you know, male again disappearing, having this seeing the, the birds and the trees. And that's actually how the book came into being. So I mentioned we made a book about trees back in 2015. We knew we needed to remake it. Um, but it was the editor made me Cochran at Tin House, um, Mindy Press in the US reached out to me in 2022, last year, um, and she wanted to make a beautiful book about trees, because for her in lockdown um, and quarantine, it was the trees that saved her, and she realised she had never actually seen them properly before. So that was, she was offered her dream book, dream project, the publishing house really wanted to support her to make, that I want to make a beautiful book about trees, and that's how she and me and the result of this, and hopefully it is a beautiful book about trees and about so much more. But it, see, that, having that huge catastrophe that happened, I suppose it was this traumatic event that happened to our species and we're still living through it, um, and it's still happening. But it brought out all of this beauty and joy and we realised a lot of, um, the, you know, what is so beautiful about our world. And that maybe we were too busy to see before. So maybe we realized she was too busy to see the trees. And for me, that's, you know, the heart of all of it is, is love. And forgive me if I've said this before, but it's about being so people to be angry. And yes, I'm really angry. I think a lot of people here are really angry. Um, and I've started using this aggressive language to you know, fight, we need to fight, this is the fight of our lives. The heart of it all is love, right? We're doing it we love this planet, it's our one and only home, and we love each other, being humans and non-humans, and, and that's, you know, hopefully the book shows you know, how beautiful everything is. It's a miracle. It's part of the gallon that are like this little tiny blue dot in the darkness of outer space. Everyone and everything we've ever loved all exists on this teeny tiny little blue dot. I think it's time to bring in some people from the audience. If you have any questions or comments, we just raise your hand and you can speak. I said, let us get another back. Yeah, just a comment on um, Obviously, this fundamental reality that we're talking about, you all believe that it's a mother 4.5 billion years old, that only had stone and metal, water, earth, fire, and air. And then Mother Nature came along 500,000 years ago, and gave a 500 billion years ago. And gave us losses and burns. The tree species came in then, the newbie, or the new kid on the block at 400 million years ago. The human species, the way in baby in the clock, is 6 million years, accordingly. From there to 318, where you say, our gay society, the indigenous gay people, use the ovum, tree lord, to build a whole philosophy of life. With their enchanted tales telling them all about the landscape lore of Gaelic Ireland. And accordingly, a fire in London in 1666, a plantation in America, with all the wood of uh, oak trees needed and all the trees chopped down, we lost that law and we've never gone back to it. And we never will because we can't live a life around trees. So, if we have a plug in and play future, it's only Mother Nature who will give us that. We have to work around whether it's prices or whether it's 
um, your Elysium builds that we want. But what I'm actually the only one who's going to sort out whatever's out there because as a 600 million year old tree species or Appalachian life, we're just new kid on the top. I have a drawing in the book, um, I don't know if you can all see it, but it's a drawing of a fossilized, <coughs> it's the world's first tree, a fossilized slice of, forgive my pronunciation, Clapstopslopsidia. Sorry. <laughs> There's a line for that. <laughs> <laughs> that. A 374 million year old tree. And it reveals the hollow core surrounded by numerous bundles of xylem, which are the larger black spots, um, with soft tissue between the smaller black dots or roots. And, you know, I included it because I think it was eight. At eight different times, we've had six, five, there have been five mass extinction events. We're currently in the sixth one, the one that we humans have created. Um, but trees always come back in this universal form, like the, the old, that universal um, alphabet. This universal form of trees keep appearing on the earth. So, um, the, I, I, I just throw, threw that in. We're talking They'll about always the survive. They'll always survive. Will yeah. be. Yeah. Rats and ants will survive even in nuclear we, Armageddon. Yeah, we don't need to survive because we haven't been here for that long. And so the universe is you know, going to be here for a long I heard Brian Cox speak at the Dalton Festival, the astrophysicist. And you know, when you think on that, so I talk in the book, I include a tree time, a section called Tree Time. Try and think maybe in a more circular because our time where you're thinking about time is very linear. I think I can think of it now like flat, where we talk about flat earth <laughs> thinkers who believe that the earth is flat. Um, we're like flat time thinkers who think that time is flat and it moves from past, present, future. It's a straight line with arrows. But it's obviously circular, right? It's a cyclical thing. And we need, if we had a tree time way of thinking, our brains, our human brains could think more in this tree time it would really help us um, with our expanded view of how everything works on much longer time scales. And again, that's, you know, the language in the title, the language of trees is about this, and the tree alphabet that I, I made is like an offering for us to try and think beyond our human-centric alphabet and our language for so much about ourselves. Everything is communicating. It's just on different frequencies, where the quail songs we can't hear unless we turn it up to the dial, you know, turn the dial. And trees communicate, <coughs> but we can't hear it with our because our senses <laughs> of everything is so limited. And so we have to expand and which involves slowing down. So there's, there's all those tensions between speeding up and slowing down because we're in an emergency so we need things to happen very quickly. But there is a, a fundamental truth in uh, what you say. Um, while I understand we have a maybe sort of year where you get people striking and say, oh save the planet, save the earth. I mean that's, that's a, I, but this idea of saving the planet is wrong. The planet will shrug us off like a bad cold. As Katie said, we've already seen five other great mass extinction events where up to 90% of all life on the Earth was wiped out. Of course, the one we remember is the, you know, the meteor hit in the Gulf of Mexico that killed the dinosaur. So it's incorrect to think, you know, we're saving the planet. The planet is pretty resilient. It's been through a lot of changes. We're fighting for a habitable Earth for us. Um, our grandkids and our, our, our children. But anybody else? Uh, uh, yes, yeah, still. The man who plants trees, everybody. Are there six hundred trees? Yeah. Yeah. Um, if, it, if nature works, nature works, and forests are very important to agree with the best expression of nature. And of course, our blueprint for how we can design places where we can use the paper. We go to the hardware stores and the card centers, 
scripts. So the apple are very good to have the application, so very good to have the application type of implementation of the marketing. So I see this all, we have good things, we put them in the wrong places. So it's all about using the forest as a, as a blueprint or a user's manual. So if you buy a car or a bicycle, your user's manual app does the label of parts by connecting together with the brake, brake, reverse brake, and brake path by the brake cable. That is kept in the back of the chain and the chain connected together by the leads. We cut through those machine fails. That's what we do in the nature, we're cutting through these connections in nature. So for so reconnecting, and Luna, of course, has an expression in nature and how um, we can use that to lay out societies and places, transport systems, and recycling systems, and production systems. So it's all very high production, one thing we have to do. One thing you said, John, one thing you said, one thing you said, we need both the manifestos and the politics and policies and the poetry of beauty and art. To me, that's no words on that complexity and simplicity. And the reason why forests work high production. 400% more productive than the modern agriculture and sheer biomass production. But the cost of the biomass is because of our complexity. And we all want to live simple lives. We want to live good nature. So there's a bit of a conflict there. So it does take complexity of simplicity. Uh, so we, I don't know if you can all hear that, but what jumped in at me was using forests as a user's manual. I love that. I hope that this is partly. Um, a way towards that, creating a user's manual. Definitely part of my hope when I went into making the book. And um, the complexity part, I studied complex systems at the Santa Fe Institute, and I had really hoped that I would be there uh, later this year or early next, and we just bump into Cormac McCarthy, sadly I didn't make it in time to pass. But yes, complexity is part of this story as well. James Glick, the um, science writer, uh, shared with me his piece on Benoit Mandelbrot, who invented fractals. Um, he didn't invent fractals, obviously, but he invented that term, word, concept. And the closer you look at something, and when I studied complex systems in, um, at the Santa Fe Institute, they used iron in the first or second class on the course. So they had the map book, not the map, they had Ireland, <laughs> the aerial photograph of this rock, this island, um, to describe in a nutshell the whole concept of complexity. And then they, zoom, they zoomed in, I think on the Barrow Peninsula, where I was a week ago. And the more you the close the more you zoom in, the more it looks like the the bigger picture, I'm not describing this, but I think you all know what I mean. So the closer you look at the cauliflower and the broccoli, it all, it repeats. You, you, look, you zoom in, you zoom in, you zoom in, you zoom in, and you're still seeing the same form, and so you could zoom in forever. And it's the ruler phenomenon, I can't remember what that phenomenon is called, but if you have a ruler, the more precise the ruler is, the longer the coastline will be, because you can measure each one of those lines. So if you have a very simple ruler, you could say, oh, the coastline of Ireland is you know, 100 miles, right? Say, if you have this little rock, it's 100 miles. But then if you have a very detailed ruler, you can go around all of those crags and then you have an infinite, you get to infinity, because it, it never ends. Uh, and so this isn't really answering your question, but for me, complexity always the very heart, the earliest works that I've ever done were simple because I'm not a visual artist kind of draw really like drawing out things and drawing to investigate to look at things and the connections between things, how things work together. And I had wanted to be a business when I was little and James Blicken's work was so important to me when he shared with you find his work. And so um, I think that's kind of you got to the heart of something that's very means a lot to me. Um, because the tree alphabet is very simple, it's a simple idea, but I hope that they're more complex. Even the simple way a tree is, the tree branches.
branches of the simple structure, but the closer you look, you see that each tree branches again and again, the way our lungs do, and this form happens throughout nature. My, I actually, part of my condition, when we did the CAT scan to check my heart, I had tachycardia, um, so I literally had a slow, uh, slow COVID, I had a slow heart rate of 60, 60, 70, and then it would go, you know, now it's sometimes 140, and I'm not doing anything. Um, so we did a CAT scan, cardiologist had to check it, and the results said the heart is more or less okay, but my lungs, which we weren't looking at in the CAT scan, my lungs have trees in bud, and this is a medical term, so I have trees in bud, so our lungs all look like they have the tree form, and the little nodules that appear, that aren't really supposed to be there in healthy lungs, and those nodules are bud, and so even in, my, and I got that diagnosis in February, and the book, the American edition, came out April 4th. So I had, uh, no, February I got the diagnosis of dysautonomia. But I suddenly knew why it had been so difficult to work on the book, because I was actually sick. Um, took 10 months to get the diagnosis. And then it was one week before the launch on April 4th that I got the CAT scan and the results saying, yes, I have trees in bud. There is an image, so basically, actually, the American edition on the left. And uh, I don't know if that shows the image where we celebrate it outside in the Elizabeth Street Garden, which is a public space that's under attack. The city wants to remove the garden to build. Um, and this, everywhere I've been on the book tour, I don't know if it's not this image, um, everywhere I've been on the tour, communities have talked about how they're under attack and they're coming together and we're forming groups and we've been both of them talked about the importance of us. You know, people there are Paddy Smith songs. So, uh, true, you know, people have the peril, and it's up to us to, to come up. Sorry, I've got the reading away from you. It's funny, but you can, you can see it there on fractals and the idea of false styles, the design manual, you know, you're not wonderful phrase from William Blake, you know, the scene of Germany and the grain of sand. Again, I think it's that, you know, connection between the poetic and the, the, the hard sciences, but they're not necessarily in intention. I'm conscious of a lot of mansplaining going on in the room tonight. Men talking. Uh, yes, thank you for I think the, the most important subject for uh, an artist is your work in climate change. That's what we've been talking about now. But my concern is that a lot of work that artists are making comes across as virtue signaling or moralistic, didactic, as if we're talking to a condescending way you know, to, to our, our audiences. So what I'm more interested in is making it some kind of meditative space where people can think about what they can individually do. So I'm just wondering, John, because you mentioned that you know, <coughs> that uh, people's responses to work in this area can range from drinking anxiety, going through to denial and disavow and turning my mind off. So I'm just wondering, Kate, in terms of your work, I felt like you were trying to find this one I'm an old style preacher. Yeah, this <laughs> different kind of fire and brimstone stuff. And that kind of thing concerns me in trying to engage. You know, there's a balance in other words. How do you strike that balance? Well, for years, like my work has always been political, and I've been working since I was in NCAD in 1994 to 1998. And um, the first image that I included here is from 1997, so I'm still a student. But we're always still students, right? We're all students of life. Um, but it's 97 when I started making works in Ardenbog. And um, I wrote that, I called that work Bog Awareness. So I was still a student, I didn't really know what I was doing. I was playing and exploring and trying to learn. I worked in the library, I was trying to absorb. You know, I'm still doing exactly the same thing now. But I never, I never called my work political. Because of that fear, so I did Erasmus in Berlin, and there was a lot of um, a lot of conversation and discussion around the art groups. There were a lot of collectives who were doing socially engaged work, and um, that was um, there was so much negative negativity around it. I didn't want to be part of that. So I thought, okay, I'm going to be interested in society, in collectives, in working together, in research, in science, in everything. Um, but I better not label myself as being that because then you get put in that box and the work isn't seen in the larger scheme of that. So I was making 
instead of the work of the you know, Everything we do is political, but it, you know, the work looking at the dog, what we were doing to the land, uh, but I just, I, I didn't label myself as a political artist. Now, um, fast forward, now oh, my bio everywhere in the book says that I'm an artist and activist, and it's become so important, because back then, you know, in the 90s, the late 90s, I knew we had problems, I knew things were really, really broken systems, what was happening at a governmental level across the country, but you know, across the whole planet. But I thought, oh, we have enough time, I can just play. I'll make these artworks and I'll, I'll try and explore through my work and I'll share. That's why I always make books and beans. It was a way to share the information I was collecting, really, with people. And um, we'd have conversations and we'd talk about it and things would be made better. We're going to fix it. And then, you know, decades pass, I get older, hair gets brighter, now my body's falling apart, and we slow down, and I realize, you know, and the, the planet's on fire, literally, everything's happening so quickly. If we knew this was going to happen, James, James Hansen and the other scientists who told us, they said, this is exactly what's going to happen. So we knew it was going to happen. Just didn't realize it was going to happen so fast. You know, right now, what we're seeing every day. Last few weeks. Anyway, so now I feel the urgency of saying, okay, everything I'm doing is so I'm using that language and saying, and an activist, and Andrea Bowers is one of the contributors of the Fearless of Women. She will also talk about being an activist. Um, so, not really answering your question, but kind of the fact, and to be honest, one of the reasons I didn't ever call my work political was that fear that what I'm doing is didactic. But I, I never wanted to tell people what to do, because I'm always just trying to understand things myself. So like I'm trying to understand, so presenting an artwork is a way to share and to have this conversation, and that you know, the viewer, the reader, everyone's smart and has their own way of reading the world, and we'll hopefully together we will all you know, create our own stories, back to the storytelling. Um, so it's really a collaborative. And I think for me, that's why it was really important that this book had so many voices, right? Because we need more voices. You can't do it on your own, or you can't do it if you're just talking to the same people. And that's one of the problems with the art world, where I thought, okay, I've got to make a book that's published and get circulated in the world. Because when you're in this art group, you share in museums and galleries, and that's lovely and very nice, um, or family. But it feels so there is that deepest, you have to go to a museum, um, you have to have the, you have the luxury to have the time to go into those spaces. And now, you know, to be honest, I find them really scary in making spaces go into art spaces because I've spent so much time out of them. Uh, I really feel like I'm in this parallel art world. Um, and I do think we're all, we're all working at it, and that's what we need. Like, we need everybody's going to do whatever you're good at, right? And everybody's good at something. But the, not at all, you might think it's not connected. I've said this many times in the talk to somebody, um, she said, look, I'm good at making cookies. Americans, they make cookies. And, and that seems so silly and frivolous, and what's it got to do, what good is it? But then she was able to bake the cookies that could help gather people together to come to talk, and then they raise money from the cookies to help fund the action that happens. So whatever it is that we're good at, it doesn't have to be communicating like that at some point. It has that skill that you can do it, or you know, painting a mural is not a good do those things. Um, but whatever it is, we just lead into what we're good at, and then that's your way to avoid the crippling paralysis that will mean you can't get out of bed in the morning. It's through action, that's what you said, right? Action is where the hope comes from. You raise an interesting issue. On the one hand, you've got Extinction Rebellion, and what's its first demand? Tell the truth. Listen to the science. But then I'm reminded then of one of the poets, T.S. Eliot, who said in his four quartets, people cannot bear too much reality. And so what is the, the balance then between, you know, being a messenger? The science is telling us, listen, this is how it is. Now, we can also take the view of James Robertson, 
and problems with the American uh, uh, activists who said, not everything that is faced can be overcome, but nothing can be overcome if it's faced. And that's why I think actually there's a lot of deep inner work involved in this issue in terms of the psychological, the emotional impact. And we're only at the beginnings of this process. I'm going to imagine more of these types of meetings in terms of we, some of us, I think, are collectively grieving for ways of life that are no longer possible. We're pre-traumatized, not post-traumatic stress. That's something that's happening. We're pre-traumatized in terms of looking and we find all sorts of ways. Interestingly, you mentioned that word, which I only found out a couple of months ago, disavow. But if you don't know, it's a psychological condition where you recognize the reality of something terrible, like the climate crisis, but then you kind of minimize it and just go on today. And you can see why people have to engage with that, because it can be completely paralyzing, as David said. And that's why I do think we need a lot more work in the mental health, the emotional resilience, for us as a people, as a community, as individuals, to be able to go through the, you know, you may know the cooler, the cooler off, you know, cycle of grief or change, you know, denial, Sammy Wilson, it's not happening. Anger, still Sammy Wilson. <laughs> Angry, and it's still not happening. Then you get to depression. And this is my daily life as an academic, as a father, as a citizen, going through all these events. Denial, the anger, depression, some degree then of reintegration, bargaining with this issue, until you get some sort of new resolution over time, ideally. And I do think we're going to need those processes in our education system, because it's our young people that will be facing this in, in, in the future. And the thing about this is the, the multiple benefits of a beautiful type of society that we've met this. It's not all doom and gloom that we have to do this because we're forced to. The world as it currently isn't, uh, or is constructed, isn't delivering. It's not delivering good jobs, good public health, education, and so on. So why are we so, you know, insistent on holding on to what, what's already here? I mean, my vision of the future is like getting a postcard from a beautiful seaside destination. It's a world that's different. It's slower. We are more food secure because we're not importing food, for example. Food security is going to be really important. We're able to have our man apples. Why are we importing apples from or copper potatoes, not from Egypt or, or Cyprus? Cleaner air, good jobs, our children are healthy and happy. Who wouldn't want that? So I think it is an onus, and thank you for pointing it out, that too often we talk about the, the problems and what's going on. That's very true. But the, the, the imagination of what could come after it, I think, needs to be also included. That's much more positive. It's like, you know, Alistair Gray, you know, a wonderful Scottish novelist. And he says, let us act as if we're in the early days of building better societies. That's that positivity that we are kind of recreating our society because we are at this point, you know, to finish on a very different genre or genre. It's like the Monty Python sketch. Our current society is a dead parrot. Let's give it a good way, a decent burial, thank it for its service, and move the effect on as quickly as we can. Why are we invested in this dead thing? Just because it's comfortable, because it's familiar, and so on. We need to thank capitalism. We need to thank carbon energy. That's fossil fuels. That made all this great stuff. Let's remember that. People who work in the fossil fuel industry are not enemies, they're not climate criminals. They were asked by society to do the job and, and they did it. I think that generosity is a better place to start in these negotiations than the blame game. As my dad was a wise peasant in County Wicklow, to all the same thing, which I always failed to do because I'm fond of the finger pointing. But when you point the finger, there are three back at you. <laughs> so what are we going to do uh, in this issue? So, anybody else? Yes. Um, I yeah. one, one thing, and it's very often, I work in change management, right? and it's around, like, when you work with this, you kind of have to be very careful about how you deliver a message. So you manage to your point as well, about you can't come in and say, you're doing it all wrong, right? And I look around the room and I see, like, really educated people, I see we all look very similar. 
And I don't see like a single mom who has to feed her kids and can't afford, can only afford, afford like McDonald's or some big franchise's exclusive food. So a big thing that I do is when I go into a place, I'd ask them, what is it that you need in order to change? So it's, it's kind of like, have we done that as a society? Have we gone to people and said, what do you struggle with and how can you? Because I, they can't afford an organic, like well-produced, biodiverse, like they're, they're living in concrete jungle. So like, I, I see this, this way of change, it needs to be kind of this. That makes me think of Kinari Webb, one of the contributors to the book, and her, her radical listening is what she does. So she's a doctor, she's a trainer. Um, doctor went out to Indonesia and realized this is what needs to happen rather than the white people flying out saying, oh, we're doctors and we can tell you what's wrong. She realized, oh wait, the people know what's wrong and they know how to fix themselves. They're missing the, the, sheen, the money part. So she realized what their job is to do is to listen and they realized, oh, the reason they're chopping down their tropical rainforest is to make money to go to the hospital. It was a cycle. Mm -hmm. And it was as simple as the simple as listening. And but that's essentially what she changed the whole system. She was this great boss guardian of the forest. Um, and it's rather than listening is the term that she used, and that's what she did to train all the staff of the medical teams now go in and it is ground up. It's from the people themselves, they know, and it's just a part of them and when the hospital to them, to be there, you don't have to chop down a tree in order to swap the tree for money in order to get their health care. So yeah, that, and that is related to you know, my project with you know, working with the friends of Martin Ball and this right of nature and that conflict. It's all about listening to each other, being able to communicate and talk about these issues which are complex. To go back to that other earlier point about the complexity. I mean, it's hard to imagine the end of the world when I mean, you can't think about the end of the week. And we need to remember that, you know, this climate and ecological crisis that we're talking about is neither a gender-free zone or a class-free zone or a race-free zone. You know, the vast majority of the negative <coughs> consumption that is high in carbon that's causing the climate breakdown is not being done by poor people. It's the rich. We literally cannot afford the rich. Our unequal societies themselves are now unsustainable. This billionaire class is often using up as much carbon as entire nations. And that again speaks to the issue of complexity. We cannot unpick and say, oh, here's a scientific solution to the ecological problem, because it then connects to these issues of class. You know, we you know, definitely talked about the legacies of colonialism and imperialism. Globally, we can tend to forget. For example, uh, we're in the Canada room, and I don't know whether this wood is actually maple. You can see outside, though, the, um, the light um, coverings have the maple leaf in it, so that will probably give them the title. Why is my question for you? Why are we in the Canada room? Because it's the best room in the, in, in the house. <laughs> I think there's some long standing connection, because you go to the back here on the right hand side, you can see all of the other land in Canadian provinces there are, but there are there's the symbols of, of each of the provinces, so there's some connection, probably a lot of money changed hands at some point in the university's history. But um, I think that leads at the back. Would you stand up please and uh, enunciate on the back row? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a, um, Go education. I would quote again, I'm very fond, as you can tell, from probably not from scientific or political science subjects, but uh, novels. So everybody knows Aldous Huxley's novel, Brave New World, kind of just this dystopia, 
a negative version of the future and so on. But just before he died, he published his utopian novel, which most people have never read, and I encourage you all to read it. It's called Island. It's about a fictional island called Pala in the Pacific. And it's about a shipwrecked Westerner rocks up on this island. And this is a kind of a green utopia, an ecological utopia. And it begins by describing the education system of its young people. So before they get to learning about maths or science, the kids learn botany and ecology. They, they become really rooted in the land. We go to the topic of, of Katie's book. There is a, in my view, both the inspirational kind of using trees and making up a new alphabet, but also the topics of the book about re-inhabiting the land. And many of us are really fully aware of the ecosystem in which we, we live, the, the bioregion, as Declan called it. So I absolutely think that we do need to have as a core part of our curriculum, ecological wisdom or ecological knowledge, in the same way that we have financial literacy, that's increasingly becoming an important part, we have mathematical literacy, and we obviously have linguistic. But why can't we have ecological literacy? But this is going to be a necessary part of what we're going to need to navigate, figure out, and create it in dealing with these complex issues. It is not good enough, even in my own university, there's an optional module that our students can all do on the Sustainable Development Goals, you know, these SDGs that you may be familiar with. I think that's great. It should be a mandatory. You should not be able to graduate in a 21st century university, regardless if you're doing a degree in physics, molecular biology, politics, law, whatever. Every student who graduates from Queen's University, and I would say all universities, all our education systems, should have some basic knowledge of the causes, the consequences, and the solutions or coping mechanisms of what we're facing ahead. Because it's through our own collective knowledge that we want to figure out what to what to do. We're only, as I say, a bit like in our uh, emotional or psychological journey and getting our heads around this issue. Uh, we're still at the, at the baby steps, even here in the academy. So never ever think that the academy and professors are smart or some of the dumbest, smartest people ever. And we do need to have our citizens demanding of us. It's one thing to demand the governments to do things. So what are we doing as a university? You know, in terms of your way, your taxes pay for my wages, by the way, so I hope you're enjoying the performance and, and the quality of the service and so on. Um, and it's something that I'll say now, I usually say at the end of these events, it's appropriate. Now, if anybody in the, in, in the audience regardless of what organization or what you're involved with, if you'd like to use the university, and there's even smarter people than me, I know it's hard to believe. <laughs> but the, the venue, to use, this is a civic university, it's our public purpose. And I say that my role, as I'm paid out, as I said, your taxes, that my job is to help at this stage, to try and help communities, help create these spaces where we can talk about these. So please, you know, get in touch with me, you want to hire uh, a venue and so on. Well, you have a question here. I just want to just make a comment this kind of thing that what some of the other guys said there as well about, about the education. I am here tonight because of these two girls that we were shouting about because I went to yoga the nature retreats that they do and they have friends as well with background in science. And we, it's just amazing just to sit, um, I suppose just to go into an open space, green space, people who know what they're talking about, who um, don't agree at me. But just love what they're doing, love the subject, love the environment, you know, like six miles up the road from where I live in Vermont, and um, but like so I just got so much out of it, you know, and then I went and bought that uh, lovely book um, in micro trees, which is why I'm here today. You know, and again these two girls told me about the awesome. But you know, it's just, I mean, it's just that, I think that's getting away to education and getting people out of nature. And I know, you know, a lot of people have got a lot of what the birds have done. And it's just very, very simple and very beautiful, you know, and it's lovely. You know, so it's great. I think that's, it just all gets to the, you know, the tree out there and this ABC and the. But even that whole thing of looking back to, you know, the, the Catholic culture, the Catholic calendar, you know, the folklore you were talking about, you know, the fairy trees, stuff like that. Why do people think like that? You know, all those different seasons, and there's a reason, you know, where people live, what they did. It's just fascinating. Yeah, what I was yeah. going to say is that I'm.
created a toolkit with when I made the Irish tree outfit for Visual Carlos. This was during the lockdowns in 2020. And so the toolkit was to share with families and schools because they were all locked down. We were all <laughs> in place. And so the Irish tree outfit, the poster was out there. And then um, the toolkit was a way to share because it's all about learning through play. And so the tree school image that pops up, that was a public art project I did with Shogin O'Sullivan and other artists in Dublin. That's for us, that's the importance of preschools, hedge schools, forest schools, learning outside. Once you step outside of the classroom, everything makes so much sense. And it's, you know, education is living and it's learning and being together and discovering. You know, when you're with children, they move at a different speed, it can be really slow and it can be really fast. But you're know, looking at you're seeing something and really looking at something is so important to me. I think all of this, you know, these questions are asking and John's offer, we shall take him up on the offer. But um, Robert McFarland, who's another contributor to the book, is also um, a lecturer, as I am, in the new school of the Anthropocene, which is this new school formed about a year ago. Um, based in London, but it exists everywhere. And it's all about trying to break up this educational system, because we know, you know, <laughs> Not really working. It's very expensive. The, the costs go up and up and up. Um, what are students getting out of it? Um, we need to break down the barriers between all the disciplines. And so that's something that we're doing at that new school. And then it's something that I hope this book is doing, right? The fact that it's break up. Um, the fact that everything is a little box. And that art is still totally there. And um, yeah, learning through play, getting outside, far spacing. Um, Introduction to all of that, and I think we should start signing books because I just realized the clock, yeah, and it's ticking. <laughs> oh, I'll close up pretty soon, but yes, I do think we should de school society and take people outside into the uh, real world. Please, just as you mentioned, all the sustainable development goals, and then I read Bigger and Seaman, which so much of us published now is literally published in the option to have a Millions of people. So I'm just wondering to what extent um, can you consider the you know, choice of publisher and you know, what they stand for, the materials that they use, how it was produced, and why that all came together um, in terms of the determination of, of what is now a physical manifestation of so much of that. Yeah, it's so important to this whole cycle of where everything came from. Um, so the book that I made in 2015 called About Trees, that was the first thing I said to my brother John, so we've got to know where the paper comes from. Because we can't make a book about trees that uses trees, any kind of trees, and is really bad. So the designers were in Berlin, um, were incredible. Foreman Concept, that's the name of the team, and they um, interviewed all the top paper people. And we ended up going with Munkin, which was the paper of choice that you know, I, I love monthly paper. Anyone here who's a paper person, you might might know it. Sorry, I don't have about trees here to show you because it's so delicious. Anyway, so we spent uh, you know, many months going through the paper to find right paper. Monkey comes from Monkdal in Sweden. That word, I don't speak Swedish, but monk was because the monks found it hundreds of years ago on the lake. And they used the water to be the mill for a long time. So what they've got is sustainable. Um, question, what is sustainable? But they do have this um, system in place where they're not polluting, there's no chemicals, they harvest sustainably, they replant. I could go and visit the forest, people can go and visit me. They could tell me in that book about trees, I had a conversation with Connie Olson from Munkin. I said, okay, the book's going to be this size, we need the exact size, this many pages and um, this edition number. So how many trees would go into making it? What species of trees? And he answered all of that, and that conversation was included in the book. So I call this meta paper. Really, uh, the fractal thing, you're looking at, looking at, and so we included all of that information inside of the book itself, and then in the second printing of the book, I was able to include photographs, for take that Connie took in the paper mill, of the pulp that went into that actual book. So when you open the book, you're looking at the photos of the pulp that went into those pages. 
I had hoped that I could have gone there and put something into the book, maybe some slides or something, so the books could then go on and be buried in the <laughs> and spread. Um, but I couldn't afford to do that. Um, so that was that book about trees. So I remained the, the editor at Tin House, which is the UK indie, reached out to me to make a book about trees. I said to him, Look, this was such an important part of the book. And luckily, Richard Powers, some of you might have read his book, The Open Story, um, he was, so when I first met him, um, he just published The Open Story, and he jumped up and he's huge, he's like a red one, and he wrapped his arms around me and said, oh, your tree alphabet, so people have shared it with me while he was working on The Open Story. Such an inspiration, so that made my heart like this. But he pushed the publishing industry, he told the author who published that book, he said, you can't just use any paper. And he's just one person, so again, coming back to the power of people, he's just one person became the famous author. But he said, look, we need to be really serious. And so they did their research and they came up with paper that's in the, my edition of, um, about, of the Language of Trees, US edition. Um, it's the same paper, so we can do Richard is in the book, the Language of Trees. And paper, so at a cellular level, he uh, helped push the, helped create my book, the other version of the book, book is in the sense. and he's pushed the American publishing industry, so now it's easier because it's part of the, the publishers know, writers are asking us of this need to know where we're getting paper, and so it's the whole cycle and now being questioned and pushed. And that was one person doing it, so we all have to, to do this, we have to question things, we have to, that means slowing things down, and publishing is all about working at speed. It happens very slowly, but then it can happen quickly, it can very quickly. So you have to say, well, actually, no, um, this is really important. So that book, the American edition, includes that paper that means no trees, it's all recycled. And um, this was published by Ellington Thompson, so the UK, but based in London, and it was printed in Cornwall, so TJ um, printers. Again, I hope to go with it in Cornwall, but they ended up printing it. Uh, so quickly that it got in print before we even launched it on June 15th. And so this paper is a combination of pine and spruce. Um, it's all in the design of such a book, Eat the Compounds, have lots of really interesting information in these books. Every single page has so much information in this book. Um, Paper, it comes from ethically source pulled from spruce and pine. And um, I haven't got a of those. But yes, it's all um, part of the story. And the stories are never ending. And we have to ask those questions. So I think one, one, two, really, really quick, because Katie does have to go. So yourself and then yourself. Oh, oh. Yeah, there's been nothing. I was just thinking that you're saying about person. You've been here. Oh, wait, no, wait. Okay, you said, like, in the middle of the edition, I like to come forth and use for a space to organize the finite things. So, Katie Patterson's future library yeah. is in this book, The Library of Trees, and my next conversation um, is going to be at the Edinburgh International Book Festival on August 15th with Katie. Okay. So, the two Katie's will be talking together. And the next day, August 16th, they're going to announce the next writer from Future Library. So it, I don't know if you know about the project, but it's super fabulous and you'll learn all about it in this book. I'll tell you, we have to buy the book at the end of the last <laughs> question or comment. Look, it's just a comment, it's not just the paper to make as well. And the ink, yeah, so we use soy-based ink in the American one, and I don't um, remember what this one is. So the inks, it's the same thing with the inks, um, because it's all printed with forest green. So we don't use black ink, um, it's forest and they are soy based. Um, let's just look at it. Oh, and Beth's, I should mention Beth Siegel. So, Richard Powers, when he was working, doing the research for Ask Norton, Norton hired Beth Siegel, who was the production manager, to do the research. And then Tim House ended up hiring Beth, who actually worked with me to make um, the American edition. Uh, but yes, it's two. His book removes more consent. That's how good it is. So can I ask you all to put your hands together? Thank you. Thank you.